brief uh, introduction, what I will say is that I met uh, Dr. Staley in 2011 when he was here interviewing for the job with uh, Devon Moore and uh, people at FSU. And he is the director of the Devon Moore um, uh, Center at FSU. With, and their mission, which fits in with what we try to do, is they are researching the proper role of government in a market economy. And more specifically, they want to look at the proper role of local government and uh, do research. Uh, and also make this research uh, accessible to the masses by uh, not only putting them in journals but also in other venues uh, like this so that we can uh, become knowledgeable and, and uh, hold our elected officials accountable to things that we think uh, benefit uh, the interests of NEVA. So with that, um, Dr. Staley has published a couple of articles recently and that's going to be the focus of his presentation and I'm proud to give uh, uh, Dr. Staley a warm NEVA welcome. That introduction and thank you, uh, Will, for uh, entertaining me and you for showing up. Actually, I appreciate that. You never, I uh, give them lots of presentations, but I never know who's actually going to show up at any point given point in time. Um, so. I've only got about 15 or 20 minutes for formal um, talks and then about 15 or 20 minutes, I think, for a QA. So there's only so, this is a pretty complicated issue and problem. So I'm, what I'm going to try and do is just uh, make some observations about what's about the city government and sort of our role, what I, I see the role is based on my experience and background, and hopefully that will trigger some questions that you might have that will allow us to probe things a little bit in a little bit more detail. First, a little bit more about me. Um, I am, as Steve said, I, I entered, came down in 2011, interviewed for the job at the Devo Moore Center. Um, I have, I'm not a Tallahassee resident, and actually I'm from Ohio, and moved from my hometown where I had an almost 50-year uninterrupted residency where we grew our, chil our children grew up. Um, I moved down here for the opportunity. So, and I pretty much worked as an urban policy person um, on a national market, actually global, um, my last five years. And so the move down here was actually a pretty significant move. But I also knew that it was going to be a move that was going to be a full-time move, and a long-term move. So in other words, my commitment to Florida State and what is now my home, Tallahassee, was not something that I was going to zip in for a couple of years and, and zip out like um, some of my peers and colleagues. Um, so I, my work in urban policy has taken me to over 100 cities, um, four continents. Um, I have well over 100 various publications, although I have a strong academic um, background. In other words, I could be tenured in several departments in the College of Social Sciences, which is where I teach. My applied work outnumbers my academic work by about three to one. Um, so my interest is not really so much in the academics or the theory. My interest is in what happens on the ground and how do we get government to work efficiently, productively in the right space that it can be effective. And even though I am a free market guy, I'll be very, I'm very upfront about that. Even my, when I go into my classes, I, I teach in urban planning um, as well as economics. And, um, but I go into my classes and I let them know where I come from. I mean, what's my perspective? I am a limited government, uh, pro-free market, pro-entrepreneurship guy. I'm not an anarch anarchist, so it's not like I'm saying no government. I'm just saying that, I, that where I tend to move toward is where are, is government going to enable entrepreneurship in order to create value that is then going to build community. So I'm a little different in the sense that I'm not solely interested in, get, in, in promoting for-profit companies. I am interested in creating value and I'm interested in creating wealth. And I also have a community foundation, which in fact my PhD is in public administration, it's not in economics. And my concentrations are in urban planning, very much around community development, as well as public finance, so fiscal policy. Where do we spend our money? How do we shift those resources into ways that it makes sense? And also to identify those places that are wasteful. So what I bring to, and I laid low for the first couple of years um, in Tallahassee. I know from my own experience, I've uh, been integrally involved in my communities of various types. Um, you can't just jump into a community and expect to know what's really going on. You can sort of read headlines, but that doesn't get you very far. And a couple things that I've learned through working for 30 years in state and local policy is that uh, very often, if you look at whether someone's a D or an R, a Dem Democrat or Republican, that tells you absolutely nothing about what they can or are interested in doing in local policy. The vast majority of people that I work with on the local level and state level are involved in, in policy and in government because they want to improve the quality of life of their community or their state. And that's where I start. And it's very, very practical at the end of the day. 
Um, so I do not look, use ideological lenses or dogmatic lenses. I let people know where I'm coming from because frankly that allows us some space for some conversation. Um, sort of give me a sense of what core values are. Um, also I've found, uh, as much as I am a free market guy and steeped in free market um, uh, interests in trying to actually enable the private sector to do great things, uh, a lot of times free, what are supposedly free market policies don't work at first. And um, not everyone is going to be as uh, free market or as limited government as I am, and I don't expect them to. So the question is, how do we work together to find the common goals? And I will have to say that my, I first understood that in looking at tax policy as a very young professional and uh, working in a think tank in the Midwest, and we were promoting low taxes. And then I would go into business groups and say, we need to lower taxes. And then I found that a lot of the business people in the, in the room were saying, well, why do you want to lower taxes? And I thought that was interesting because I, I just thought that would be something we would normally expect. Well, it was a very important lesson for me because it actually is framed almost every way I look at local um, economic development from moving forward because people don't mind paying taxes if they know what those taxes are going to and they think they're be, those dollars are being used productively. So at the end of the day, I mentioned before, I'm not an anarchist because government provides roads, provides sewers in many places. Um, in Tallahassee, they provide utilities. Um, there may be different ways of providing those, but that's what, that's the reality of it. So yes, I mean, if we don't have taxes, we don't have revenue to pay for our public services, and we don't have a solid community, and we can't promote economic development. So we try to take in the Duvo Moore Center a very nuanced approach to looking at this. So our general lens is free market, pro-business, well, I'm not say pro-business, uh, pro-free enterprise. Um, so we really don't weigh in on whether or not you're going to make money or not. That's sort of that's for our consumers to decide that. You put a product out there, they're either going to buy the product or they're not. So we, you know, our job is not to make sure you make money. Our job is to create an environment in which you can try to test the waters and put your products out there and either survive or fail based on a market test, not a political test. And so that's the, the framework. And we use a lot of students as part of our, our research to do that as well. So. Um, so, but the other part that I learned in working with a lot of officials and a lot of staff is that the staff are really very often very good at what they do. And they're very, very professional. And one of the most important things we did to uh, try to achieve <coughs> movement on policy was to recognize we had to agree on the facts. Before we could talk about questions about should the government even be doing this, we had to agree on the facts. And I was really shocked early in my career about how often we just didn't agree on facts. And part of that is because the facts were not available. And only certain people with specialized knowledge and, and ability to navigate the process had access to those facts. So a lot of what we do in the Devote More Center, it's been part of what I've been doing for 30 years now, is at least recognizing there might be some policy differences we have, but let's get the facts out. Let's agree on what the facts are. And then we can start talking about some of these other issues which are important. So transparency is really important to me. And then also, both as a manager, as an executive of an organization, as a founder of two uh, public policy think tanks, um, I am very, and also thank you to my public administration degree, which really gave me some great organizational behavior and management tools. I'm a strong proponent of mission-based organizations where you have objectives and goals that are tied to how resources are used and performance-based management. So our mantra is, Transparency, accountability, and performance. And that and you can't do those any of that you can't do the performance without the accountability. You can't do the accountability without the transparency. And I think those are good rules and we try to live by that in our, our nonprofit work that we do. But also I think they're critically important for government. Um, the, the government is a public enterprise in the sense that they are doing something for the public. Um, for a public purpose, and so we should know where that money, where, where the money comes from, what it's being spent on, and whether or not that, that those dollars are actually being spent on the right things. So that brings me to Tallahassee. So I laid low for a number of years, uh, tried to get my house in order on campus, and tried to get my classes in order, and really get a sense of the pulse of the community on campus, and my peers who are going to be evaluating me, as well as my dean who signs, signs my contract. That is very important. And uh, also, you know, uh, Steve mentioned I'm the director of the DeVoe Moore Center, so I needed to get to know DeVoe Moore, who I think many of you are familiar with him one way or the other. Um, 
I'm going to talk a little bit about DeVoe. Um, again, uh, working in public policy think tanks, particularly those that are free market, you become very sensitive to where your money comes from and how that might be either be perceived to be tied to what you actually produce. Uh, it's a legitimate question. I encourage anyone to ask that question. I have some peers in the think tank world that get very frustrated with those questions. I embrace that question because one, I need to be forthright to people about where the money comes from, how it actually funds our operations, and whether or not it does have a relationship to what we produce. I think that is a legitimate question, particularly working in a nonprofit. But also, Florida State is a public entity as well, so that transparency is part of that. So, I would be um, misleading you if I came up here and said DeVoe Moore has no, no uh, interaction with us. He does, in fact, but I was also very clear that if we were perceived as DeVoe Moore's think tank, we would have no ability to influence anything. So, um, and this is what I learned. I think this is important. I actually talked about this more now than I, I certainly did from earlier because I didn't have the knowledge. So I, I interact pretty regularly with DeVoe. Um, and uh, I really respect what he's built um, as an entrepreneur, as a commercial developer, and I've also learned to really respect his commitment to this community. Um, he really loves Tallahassee, and he loves FSU. That's been I don't leave one meeting with DeVoe without DeVoe saying, are the students learning what they need to learn? There's not one meeting I leave without him asking that question. And he, that's part of my accountability, my personal accountability to him, as I show him how our students are benefiting from his gifts that created the DeVoe Moore Center. It's also important to know that the DeVoe Moore Center is an endowed center. So as far as I know, DeVoe has not put any money into it since 1998. Um, but that gives us, it's, we've got a nice endowment, employs me, keeps my mortgage paid, um, and that's, that's beneficial um, to a number of people, including my family um, as well. Although I love what I do so much, it probably wouldn't have to be paid quite as much, although Many people would be saying, no, you do need to be paid more, more in fact, but yeah, that's another issue. Um, some people have more materialistic interests than, uh, I love, I love FSU, I love my students. Um, I love what we're doing, I think we're adding value. But here, back to the original story. So um, DeVoe clearly has been in this community for a long time. As a business person, he's been interacting with the city and county for a long time. Um, and anybody who's been doing that for 40 or 50 years is going to have issues, let's just say that. And many of you have read about those issues in the paper over the last 10 years, maybe? Has DeVoe been yeah, probably. Probably about 10 years? Yeah. Um, so those ended up on my plate. Um, but I, what I didn't do, and I've, uh, fortunately I've never uh, had to worry about this because we've, I've always had very deliberative research processes in all the think tanks that I've founded and created and run the process for. Very strong peer review, external review, we vet everything to make sure it's accurate because again, facts are important. What I found, and so what, it, what happened is I'd get issues put on my desk and then I had to sign a research assistant to go research it. And we would only, so we, the question is, is my, I don't like to work in anecdote. Um, I like to work in trying to find patterns and see if we can see, because that's when we need systemic change. And I'll say this, um, everything that DeVoe put on my plate, there was something to it. There's absolutely something to it. Whether it was something that would rise to the level that we thought we could publish it um, and make it public, not always, because so much of it was very anecdotal and it was very sort of, a, and it, it didn't really, I couldn't really see how it was gonna add to the public discussion, but everything had some kernel of important <coughs> truth to it. And so part of our task has been to try and figure out how we can go beyond Devo, sort of meet the people in the business community, understand how they work with city processes and get something larger than just the anecdote. And so we can do that. However, um, if you get a chance, there is a study we published on cell phone tower regulation, which I know oh, uh, five people just went to sleep, cell phone tower regulation. Um, this is, uh, it, it is actually one of DeVoe's projects that we mapped through the regulatory process. And it took us five years to get to the point we were willing, I, I was willing to pull the trigger on that study. And we spent two and a half years just checking out the details of the notes that we had. But I'll tell you what, if I had a research assistant like DeVoe, if I had five of those like DeVoe, we'd be blowing the doors off every think tank in the nation. Um, I literally was given a document that had notes on 100 meetings with city <coughs> officials in the process of developing, trying to get the permit approval for that cell phone tower. 
that kind of richness in detail is very, very rare. And I've been working in land use policy for a long time. And the biggest issue I run into as a researcher and a policy analyst is nobody wants to talk to me because they're afraid it's going to go public. And if it goes public and somebody doesn't like what you've been saying, you will no longer get a housing uh, permit in that community. I was chair of my local planning board. I know how that works. As much as we try to be forthright and transparent with it, and that's just the dynamics of it. And frankly, it's a legitimate concern. So I laid low for a little while, and we really try to research everything so we make sure it's accurate. Um, and then I finally came to the conclusion about four years ago that Tallahassee has a serious problem. Um, again, I've looked at a lot of different cities, and what has shocked me about this city and the town is one, how little trust there is in local government. Um, what's interesting about the CRA and the FBI Pro, and again, I don't have any insight into the okay. FBI Pro. I do understand the dynamics because I've been following urban policy. I actually have. In the 1980s, I was doing some of the primary research on enterprise zones, trying to figure out if these were effective mechanisms for redeveloping our cities. Most of my work is in the Midwest and the Northeast. We're dealing with real significant urban decline. My hometown saw a 50% reduction in its population over a 20 year period. Tens of thousands of jobs, manufacturing jobs leaving. We were trying to figure out how we can get those cities back. So I understand a lot of this. And what, what was sort of interesting is that when the FBI probe um, broke, and I was talking to some press, and I was also talking to other people in the community, one, um, how many people shrugged their shoulders and said, oh well, you know, we're in Tallahassee. Second, what did you expect? I mean, this is the kind of stuff. And media were having trouble getting anyone to say something on the record. I went on the record because that's what I do um, on this. Although I, I, I try to be careful about um, not implicating any individual because I also know enough about these situations where it's not necessarily individuals and I want to let the process play out. But the question then becomes why do we have this deep-seated skepticism and cynicism about city and county? And I think at the end of the day what it comes to, and we've found this in our regulatory processes, and I'm not going to be able to go into all the details um, um, because Steve's going to pull me off here in a few more minutes, um, one way or the other. Um, there's just this very little transparency in the process, and whether it's budgeting, um, whether it's the regulatory process, and people really don't know what's happening inside the black box. And interestingly enough, before coming here, I checked on the city of Tallahassee's <coughs> website, went to the budget process, because three years ago, I sent one of my top senior economics researchers to try and find, see if there were any performance measures in the city budget and how they were related to funding. And this is an important test because I can go through a budget and I can figure it out, but I'm a professional. I've got a PhD in public administration. I spent four years just researching and understanding bureaucracy. I do budgeting. I examine, but I've, I've deconstructed and reconstructed state Medicaid budgets. I've deconstructed and reconstructed city budgets. I understand how to navigate that. But that is a very specialized set of tools and knowledge that you develop over decades. I wanted to know if a smart 20-year-old could go in online and find out what their government was doing. He couldn't. He could not figure it out. That's not to say the information isn't there. In fact, when I went online today, I think it's much better organized today than it was when we started doing this before. But there really aren't good performance measures. Um, well, th there may be, but I don't know where they are, and I can't see them, and as a citizen, I need to see them. That's how you build trust. That's how you build civic trust in this. And I think the CRA is getting caught up in a lot of this as well, and that's actually going a whole, a whole different direction. And I'm gonna close on, on these comments, and then hopefully I've triggered some things for, some questions for y'all. Um, and, and, and by the way, they can be as hard questions as you want. I, I believe me, I've been through the gauntlet. Um, national TV, national whatever, don't worry about it. And um, we, we, I will try not to punt. If I don't know the answer, I will let you know that I don't know the answer. And it may even be very embarrassing, but I'd rather be embarrassed in public than someone thinking I'm trying to, to sort of pull the wool over their eyes in one way or the other. But um, when we were doing, I was working with a national think tank called Reason Foundation, um, and we were doing a lot of fiscal policy, and I was doing a lot of um, land use policy. and. Uh, one of those projects was looking at productivity in cities. And we looked at the top 50 cities in the country and which ones were the most efficient, which ones were the most productive. 
And so then we went into the case studies. And this is one of the things that struck me is that Cleveland actually made it up there at the time, which many people would not have thought about it. But Cleveland had, and I've, I've passed out the, or the, the op-ed on the, the people's budget one. Um, that, you might think that that is just sort of a populist type of idea, just to you know, put, it, put it out there. In reality, that's what Cleveland had. Cleveland, you could go to Cleveland. At that time, this is well before we had the internet accessibility, but you could get a booklet and on every page was an agency. On every page was how much they spent on that agency. On every page, they had three to five performance metrics, and they tied those, those resources to those metrics. So you could see what was happening in the fire department. You could see what was happening in the police department. Extraordinary transparency tool. So the people's budget that I mentioned there, actually there was a model for that. And when I looked at it, I could, not being from Cleveland, I could, in a snapshot or very little time, I knew what they were doing with their money. And Cleveland was facing a lot of real serious problems, far more serious than anything that Tallahassee has faced. Um, they actually had their river on fire at various times because of environmental pollution. Um, lots of issues. Um, so, but you could see where the money was going. And here's the other thing, which I think um, elected officials tend to underappreciate, is when you have that kind of transparency, not only do you build confidence in the citizenry, but budgeting, budgeting for management allows you to set priorities and identify priorities and know where your resources are being most effectively used. It allows you to be more proactive. It allows you to connect with your citizens on substance, not just platitude. That's how you build civic trust. And you can do that on a very large, I've seen large cities do it. Cleveland at the time was much bigger than Tallahassee. It's only a little bit bigger than Tallahassee right now. But Tallahassee is a small town. Most of the people in this room have either known of each other or know each other for a long time. Um, for, you know, 75,000 of the people of the population of this region are students, 18 to 25. So net that out of the 320 that make the region, you're a lot smaller than you even think you are at that point. This is, so why can't we embed this kind of culture, this kind of leadership in city? and city and county, county government as well. And there are tools, and the interesting thing is one of the things I talked about in the op-ed is that we have some of the top academic experts in the world in the ASCII School of Government of Public Policy. And a lot of them have applied backgrounds. They're not purely academics. And when, when that op-ed came out, what was interesting, because I also mentioned we had to pull these people together in a task force and figure out what are the performance metrics. By the way, that is not an easy thing to come up with a performance metric. It's hard, it's really hard. But here we have expertise. This is the first thing I've written in the paper where I actually got my peers to say, yes, this is something we think we could be part of if we could do it. So um, I think there's a lot of traction to this. I think it's really <coughs> crucially important for the city and as well as the county to really make efforts to do this. And it can be done. It's going to be hard. It's going to take time. There's no silver bullet. But I think it's going to be crucial for building a foundation of trust civic trust, but also aligning um, resources with priorities so that we can really create the foundation that's necessary for true economic growth. So I'm going to stop here. And let and I'm open to whatever slings and arrows you want to throw at me at this point. Let's give my hand. CRA is in the news, obviously, Community Redevelopment Agency, um, and it's important that we understand exactly what it is. So if, could you take just a few minutes and describe what the CRA is, what the legitimate purpose is, um, without passing judgment, just give sort of the idea of how it's supposed to work. Sure. And I, I, uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Hopefully. Okay. And I should also note that Marianne's on the board, so, um, and I would and I invite you to correct anything that you think is wrong. Um, because part of the issue here is um, with CRAs, and this is, um, CRAs have been around a long time, and they, they are really created in very, they, they have different properties in different states, depending on what laws are, how the laws are set up, and the way cities use them. But basically, CRA is an attempt to try and jumpstart redevelopment in blighted areas of cities. Um, that's where they started. And uh, blight has been around as long as cities and human existence have been around. It's just that we started putting terms on them in the 60s and 70s when we started creating programs. And the community reinvestment agencies are in the community reinvestment areas are attempts to try and, and put a boundary around a geography, like a neighborhood. I live in Midtown. I'm actually in Levy Park, right on the edge of Frenchtown. So actually, 
ride my bike onto campus through Frenchtown almost uh, every day. Um, so all kind of times of the night, and it's very interesting, to, to, to say the least. Um, uh, but it's the idea is that these are areas that the market has generally left. Um, I can go into details on why the market would have left some of these areas. I'll try and refocus some of that reinvestment to try and get these communities back on a growth path and into a more productive growth path. In other words, um, off the streets and into the into real storefronts that really generate long-term value and growth. And so tax incentives are often a part of it. Um, I think here we have uh, tax increment financing has been a huge part of this, which, um, and then also you'll have revolving loan funds. So you'll actually have a loan pool, people will make loans, they pay that back, and that goes into future investment and grants. And uh, CRAs, as Marianne was, uh, we were talking about earlier, is they also do some just community events and investment, that type of things. They take a wide range of different character, it depends on the local community, but that's generally the point. I'm going to assume that Adam Corey is not in the room. If you are, I don't mean to insult you, but um, actually if you look at how he managed the process, it would have been exactly the way I would have done it. If I believed in my project, I believed in my restaurant, I would have taken advantage of everything that was offered to him in that process, so I don't really fault him for doing it. But the, but the issue was, but if you look at that process and the way it led it up to it, and again, I'm coming at this from you know, 30 years of looking at urban development at different places and specific investments. That restaurant wasn't going to work. Um, it just simply wasn't. The, the, the fundamentals were not in place to allow that to work. This is not Manhattan. This is not Orlando. It is not Nashville. It is not, we are a 320,000 population city that is North Florida. That's destination is either the state capital where people are in and out as quickly as they can, or they are students and they're coming to the university. That is not enough to build that kind of a high-end restaurant on a space that is not integrated in with the rest of the social fabric of the city. So um, we got into trouble because we thought, oh, that's a great idea. Why don't we do that? And then we have this wonderful building that we really love to try and preserve. Now, now I, as much as I personally would not have voted in favor, not just of the project, but probably of even keeping the building, the reality is that's a community decision if they want to keep the building, if they want to save it for posterity or history, history, that decision should be made. But don't confuse it with an investment in economic development. That is a community, um, it's a, sorry, community investment decision. It's about trying to preserve legacy. It's about trying to preserve history. That has really very little to do with economic development. So that's where we get into trouble, is when we start, and by the way, venture capitalists know this. Uh, yeah, I remember talking to someone recently, because we're talking about entrepreneurial, you know, they have the entrepreneurial ethic or whatever it is we're trying to create, which I'm all in favor of. I think an entrepreneurial city is really, really important. But we went through this in the 80s and 90s. This is not the first time entrepreneurship has been the front and center in economic development policy. Here are some of the lessons we learned. One is that it's really hard to pick the ones that are gonna succeed. In fact, we did have private and public incubators that just were all over the place in the 80s and 90s. Um, uh, when we did the performance evaluations, the private incubators did a little bit better than the public in incubators. Uh, but for the most part, most businesses fail. And picking which one's gonna succeed and which one's not. So what, what is interesting, if you look at venture capital and what happened, they went from a model in the 80s where they were saying, great idea, let's invest in your idea, and let's invest in you, to tell you what, great idea, we think we might want to invest in you, but let, you know, go work on that prototype, and we'll see, do a little bit of market testing, and then come back. And then maybe we'll put a million or two million dollars into your project at that point. And even then, venture capitalists will tell you, four out of five of your projects or your, your businesses are not going to succeed. It's a very high risk, high potential payoff, um, but I really don't think that's what cities should be involved in. We're, we just don't have the institutional makeup to be successful, and often we end up squandering resources as a result. That can be going into, like, paving my road. Where I live on. That would be good. Thank you, Dr. Staley. Yeah. Thank you.